bet the board. What do you mean you don't bet? I mean, I don't bet. You know, I don't care. I don't I never have, and I never will. Yeah, right. I bet you 20 bucks I can get you gambling before the end of the day. You owe me 15 grand, pal. Pay him. Pay that man his money. It's the Bet the Board podcast. God likes me. He really, really likes me. In the end, I wound up right back where I started. I could still pick winners, and I could still make money for all kinds of people back home. And why mess up a good thing? Here's Payne Insider and Todd Furman. Welcome into the Bet the Board podcast, NFL Week 16 Holiday Edition. We'll not only cover the games on Thursday, Sunday, but also a little bit of Monday night football action on Christmas Day between the Ravens and the 49ers. I'm your host, Todd Furman, joined as always by my esteemed colleague and co-host, the one, the only Payne Insider. And Payne, I have to ask, even before we get into games, have you had your first white Russian of the holiday season? I know you took one down in Manhattan, but are you waiting until Saturday to crack the Kahlua? That was the first one. Is that going to be the only one? Are we getting right back into the white Russian push? I think we may have a a white Russian in our future. All right. There we go. My guy. My guy. I was was told that we're not allowed to to banter or uh, joke around on this podcast. Now, he probably doesn't listen to the NFL podcast, so he'll never know. But uh, <laughs> no, no small talk. Yeah, there's at no the beginning of these podcasts. There's no man. shot that aforementioned individual that you're tuning in for said he wanted a you know peaceful, calm podcast. He's a college football guy. His opinion doesn't mean anything on Sunday, so we'll throw it out well, there. If he happens to let listen, let me ask you this. Fire away. I'm dying to hear this. <laughs> the big question is, how are you doing? I'm shocked you're here. Uh, look, I figured I'm you'd a, have a mouthful of gauze. Sounds like you got marbles in your mouth for our listeners. What's what's going uh, on? With you? I'm a trooper here. 15 stitches in the mouth. The old hockey injury coming back to rear its ugly head. I, I wish I had video of what exactly transpired in the chair, but you know they give you a little Novocaine, numb you up some. I look like Frankenstein if I pulled back my lip. But you know some of us have to tough it out. Pain. This life of being a podcaster isn't nearly as glorious or as glamorous as our listeners are led to believe. Did you wake up with your shirt untucked? No, I did not wake up with my shirt untucked, (laughs) but I will say because I was cognizant and uh, fully operational through the entire time, I did get the uh, surgeon having a full conversation with his assistant there. It didn't cross any boundaries. I in no way, shape or form felt violated by the experience. Uh, So all is well that ends well, as long as I don't get gangrene on that side of my mouth. Sounds like Tim Watley was, was not your, uh, your dentist. The big question here, though. I did not get invited to Tim Wally's holiday party either, so I was a little <laughs> disappointed by that. Focus in here. <laughs> it is December 21st. You decided that something that might impact you eight years down the road, you were going to have that dental surgery in the midst of NFL season, bowl season. We couldn't we couldn't schedule that thing for the third week of February. No, you get it out of the way. Like sooner rather than later, you get you get it knocked out. It's a little cleanup. Look, if Darius Slay can go out there and have surgery on his lower body and the Eagles need him out there on the field, he's got to be ready for the postseason. So the last thing I could have afforded was postseason complications. Pull Billy out for some of the highest leverage games of the season. So worst case, if I was on the shelf this week, Brad did an outstanding job with the college football podcast. Uh, for all the listeners, 29 games in detail. You know, I could have gone to the bullpen. I could have tapped on the right arm. No Monday podcast, a little extra recovery time built in. So there was some level of strategy involved in this. Interesting. Interesting. All right. To the Saints Rams. All right. We Saints go. Rams lead us, game. Lead us. Well, Thursday night football action. A big weekend in the NFL. I mean, when you look at the Cowboys, Dolphins, 49ers, Ravens, it'll play each other this week. First time since 1980, Payne, the top four teams in point differential all face each other this late in the season. But St. Rams intriguing for a variety of different reasons as both teams have goals set to try and get into the playoffs. A pair of seven and seven teams. The Saints are tied with the Bucks in the AFC South. The Rams hold the final playoff spot of the season. And ended today in the NFC. Both offenses have found their stride in recent weeks. New Orleans putting up 24 or more points in three straight games. You look at the Rams, they're humming as well. 28 or more in four straight games, potentially setting the stage for a little bit of entertainment value this evening, despite the Saints coming in, going 16-4 and four to the under over their last 20 games. And Dennis Allen Payne, 
you know, was already building in excuses for his Saints. It doesn't really matter what I think about the travel. Obviously, our job is to go out and play the game. It's tough. It's challenging when you have to go on the road for a Thursday night game, particularly when you have to travel across the country. But it is what it is. Glad to see Dennis Allen telling everyone to put those distractions to bed. But when you look at this game, you know, Derek Carr has been limited in some of his capabilities at quarterback. Performed all right last week against the Giants. Three touchdown passes without his top weapon in Chris Olave. Matthew Stafford, like a fine wine, getting better with age. Uh, seeing how he can distribute the football. The Cooper Cup and P- P- Puka Nakua has been outstanding. But Kyron Williams, the bell cow in the backfield, giving the Rams a dimension when he's in the fold. So when you look at a game like this... Is there a particular matchup you think that'll decide it, knowing that the Rams opened as four, four and a half point favorites, that number is now down to three and a half, and you look at a total that opened 44, now leaking out to 46? Dennis Allen was unaware that his team's been on a bye the last two weeks. He's complaining about this. How dare you talk that way about Tommy Cutlets on a short week? <laughs> I think this is, you know, extremely difficult game as a better because you know you're ingrained with price is you know not the end all be all but is the the first factor right i think if you looked at your core rating and then the building this game's being played in there's really no way you get to four and a half and now that alave is is upgraded we're starting to see this saints money come into the market and even if you think about these teams where they they started the season Right, you go all the way back. Like the Saints took pro money over their win total, eventually closed as high as nine and a half. Rams took pro money under their win total, eventually closed six and a half. And so you could absolutely think this is too much of a price adjustment. And I'm sure if you're someone who's digging into things and maybe not digging into them deep enough, you're going to be like, oh, there was, there was a meeting last year where these two teams played, and Dennis Allen really got the best of Sean McVay. And the Rams offense got held to a 38% success rate in that matchup. The deeper you look, though, you kind of realize, hey, there's no Cooper Cup in that matchup. Puka wasn't a thing. You know, Matthew Stafford left the game and we had the the Bryce Perkins experience for a large portion of that game. So I didn't really take much from that McVay Dennis Allen data point in week 11 last season. I look specifically at what's going on now. And I know the Saints have won back to back games. Come against the Panthers and the Giants. I mean, dominant the Panthers pain, dominant that defense. They they really weren't. Right? I mean, the Panthers outgained the Saints in their own building by almost 100. Yards. It was ugly. Saints had yeah, it was ugly. I mean, the Saints had 207 total yards of offense, less than 300 yards of offense against the Giants last week. And now, to your point, like traveling on a short week, a little bit of a time adjustment. I think the other side of the ball, though, is is where the larger questions lie for me and. You know, you look at some things where, yes, like Stafford has been worse against man coverage this season than zone, and the Saints play more man. But we came into the season, if you remember, like the thesis about the Saints defense was they'd be down this year, and that many of the key parts are trending older. The interior of the D-line parts have been substantially downgraded. The pass rush has has deteriorated. And so, like right now, there's been a dip in the Saints' defensive efficiency year over year. It isn't massive, but the kicker is these old guys on a short week. And then you think about the schedule New Orleans played. It's been the second easiest schedule of offenses this season. So the dip in the Saints defensive performance has happened while the schedule's gotten much easier. Even recently, you go down the list of quarterbacks in the offenses the Saints have played. Oh, it's ugly. I mean, it's brutal. It's it's you got a struggling rookie in Bryce Young, undrafted rookie Tommy Cutlets to your point, right? Those are offenses thirty and thirty one. You have a newly benched Desmond Ritter leading a bottom ten Atlanta offense in the sample. A recently benched Josh Dobbs, a Bears offense that's still bottom ten in the NFL. And a, and, it, well, and a Bears have, offense with Tyson Badgett, not even with Justin Fields. Yeah, that is true. And and you look over the stretch, the Saints have played literally this entire season one top 10 offense and they caught them in an offensive lull at home and still gave up 30 points and and didn't meet market expectation and now the saints play another top 10 offense in the rams that's trending even better than its full season data so i mean i'm looking at this you mentioned kyron williams since the return of of him oof i mean the offense is just flowing right now for the Rams you talk to people in and around the organization and Kyron just opens up everything he, for the offense he's gonna be weeks. he's gonna be RB2 next year in fantasy drafts behind Christian McCaffrey the way things are going 
I think that sounds exactly right. And potentially, yeah. I mean, if Stafford and, and McVeigh are back, yeah. I, w- I would agree with that. But you look over the last four weeks since Kyron Williams has been back, only the 49ers offense has a better EPA per play than the Rams. And within that four-game sample, the Rams have played – the opposite type of schedule of the Saints defense, right? Number one and number two defenses and efficiency. And one of those data points is a dome team playing outdoors in horrific weather against Baltimore. So that was extremely impressive to me. The Saints are bottom 10 schedule adjusted run defense. Saints lead the league in rate of runs allowed that gain 10 plus yards. So you would think Kyron Williams is going to be fired up in this game. Matthew Stafford has also been uh, substantially better when he's kept clean and I'm not shocking right the guy's a 36 year old pocket quarterback so that makes sense but Stafford's graded out QB six out of 42 qualifiers when kept clean 80 percent adjusted accuracy when pressured that accuracy dips to 57 percent that puts Stafford 36 out of the same qualifying 42 quarterbacks the positive is here is the Saints again don't get pressure 30th in pass rush win rate they struggle getting to the quarterback I know Isaac Gidham and Paulson Medebo are both having career years at corner for the Saints I think a sizable part of that improvement is the QB play and offense as the Saints have faced. Marshawn Lattimore was hopeful to return for this game. That seems unlikely. Again, Alave got upgraded. And so I think you're going to see this, right? We're already seeing a trend in the market, three and a half, saw four. So I think we're going to see market support for the Saints. There's been some talks of some buy orders on the Saints. It's, it's just not for me. I think the Rams are going to have some offensive success here. I'm right there with you. Came in, had this game circled as I go through my process each and every week. All right, I want to try and make a case for the Saints. Did the deep dive as we always do to break these things down for the show. Went not going to see a path for me to get to the Saints, uh, especially as the number trends closer to field goal. If anything, I may find myself on the public if, you know, heaven forbid this thing got down to three minus 20 or somewhere in that general vicinity. So interesting game to say the least uh, with two teams that you're looking at trending in the right direction, or at least one of them in the Rams late in the season, that can be a very difficult out. Whereas the Saints went out, suddenly they find themselves in the thick of things to get to the postseason. On to Sunday we go, Payne. Uh, And this game had all the makings of a fun one if both teams were at full strength. And that, of course, is the Cleveland Browns on the road at the Houston Texans. But unfortunately, that doesn't appear to be the scenario that'll play out. Cleveland, a two and a half point road favorite. Total on the game, 40. We've seen... The number flip favorites. The Texans opened as a one and a half point favorite. We're optimistic that CJ Stroud could clear concussion protocol, but Houston pretty much said early this week that ain't going to happen. So it leads us to believe that Case Keenum will make his second start against yet another former team in the Cleveland Browns. The win at Tennessee in week 15 was the first win for Keenum in a start since 2021 when he was a member of the Browns. They actually snapped a 30 game losing streak when trailing by 13 plus points for the Houston Texans was the third longest active streak in the league. Meanwhile, when we look at the Browns, they have been the cardiac kids all season only team in the league with multiple wins this season when trailing by 10 plus points in the fourth quarter they have also been extremely fortunate in tight games going five and zero in games decided by three or fewer points this season and Payne, one of the things people will talk about is oh well look at the browns home road splits in terms of what they've done defensively you dig into some of these browns defensive numbers and this is a group that's allowed 110 points off of turnovers this season the last three teams to make the postseason after allowing 110 plus points off of turnovers all went on to make the Super Bowl because it tells me regression is a thing the offense protects the football and you can be a little bit more buttoned up but Joe Flacco hits the injury report himself with a little bit of a lower body issue imagine he'll be out there but something worth monitoring when you look at a game like this Houston's injury report looked to be longer than reading any sort of Christmas story from prominent English authors the Texans gonna have enough healthy bodies to go out there and compete knowing what's at stake on Sunday fully converted love it the wife has gotten stop. to you stop stop it stop <laughs> it we had the menorah lit we celebrated hanukkah the proper way had my potato lockies on sunday mom made them the old-fashioned way so we split responsibilities in this day and age don't guys, you go trying quote, to proselytize over there quoting, quoting christmas carols here on the podcast okay um, well, Charles Dickens never really wrote a long Hanukkah story, true. unfortunately. That's true. Not like you've ever that's read a true. Christmas Carol, anyway. So <laughs> more of a more of a movie guy. Um, <laughs> I'm a okay. book on tape guy. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the key factor in this game are are the injuries, and you mentioned the the long list for the Texans. The key cog being being Stroud, and that's why we've seen. The five point move through the zero from the Texans minus two and a half at peak to the Browns minus two and a half. And I think Deepak on Monday 
who is a guy connected pretty closely to the Texans, had some great injury news. As a fan, by the way, I don't want to specify that. As a fan, he's got a good connection to the Texans. Um, kind of let everyone know on Monday, hey, like Stroud never even started the concussion protocol last week with practices because his symptoms were so bad. Didn't even log a limited. This week, beat reporters said Stroud is still sensitive to light, and he missed a charity event this week, his own. I'm not playing Dookie Hauser here, but like if you, you can't put Sick on reference and penny loafers, good reference right? out of you, <laughs> right? You're probably not suiting up with with pads and cleats days later to be chased around by like 300 pound men that run four six on on concrete. Um, so it's not just CJ Stroud either, right? We know Tank Dell is out. Nico and Noah are battling injuries. If they play, they're not going to be 100. percent And really, where you're looking at this Texans offense, it's got this massive dichotomy where like, hey, still a bottom five run offense, you know top seven pass offense and now all of a sudden like all the key cogs to this pass offense are are now out or less than 100 percent and so you really have to have to downgrade the texans here and you know will anderson think about him right i mean everyone was like hey this this was a tough trade they gave up a bunch of you know future assets and and certainly that's the case will anderson as a rookie top five in both pass rush and run stop win rate kids a star he is yeah unlikely to go and all in all like 15 players on this Texans injury report and so you know I look at the matchup with those injuries in mind and you mentioned right at the top there about the Browns road home splits defensively some of which to your point are turnover related setting up the defense in poor situations the other thing and and you know it's interesting because I the Browns defense is still, you look, right, it's it's number one. And I think we said this, like, hey, you know, it's probably not as good as that. I think we're right. But I'm kind of pushing back here on the narrative that the the road defense is just dog shit. I, I look at the road, and the Browns are giving up gobs of explosives. That's the difference, right? They're bottom five in the league in yards per pass attempt allowed. Bottom five and explosive pass rate allowed on the road. But you look at the down to down stuff. It's been just fine, right? They've allowed less than 59% of passes to be completed. So not just the turnover regression that's setting up the defense in bad spots, you just the explosive regression. We know that's not as predictive as the down to down stuff. And again, you look this week on the injury report, all signs are kind of pointing towards lead corner Denzel Ward finally returning. He's logged limited practices for two straight weeks. Finally on Wednesday, he logs a full. Today's obviously a big day. If he logs another full, I think he's back out there. And so kind of where I'm going with this is like, it's Case Keenum without Tank Dell with a less than 100% Nico and Noah and then Ward's potentially back. And if that's the you know equation, so to speak, is the fear of explosive passes and explosive plays like as much of a worry for Cleveland's defense? And I just... I watched last week's game intently, a game in which, you know, the Texans trailed by double digits to the 27th ranked Titans pass defense in case Keenum was seven for 14 on throws 10 plus yards with two turnover worthy plays. I just don't know if the Texans offense in this state is going to be able to hit the explosives that have really wounded that that road Browns defense. And, you know, listen, I think the Texans have exceeded all expectations this season. It's been a great year and I get Houston still in the playoff hunt. But without C.J. Stroud and Will Anderson, the Texans are a bottom 10 type team. And, you know, there's been a lot of support here from professional bettors on the Browns. And I think even if you were to bet the Browns now and lay, you know, a cheap money line price relative to the two and a half or your little, you know, don't love the idea of of laying the money line, you want to lay two and a half. Like, I think this gets to three the reason I would maybe prefer the money line is it at least provides some options if this were to get to three or three and a half you can kind of play that middle game because you hinted at it at the top some intel came across the desk about Joe Flacco being pretty banged up and needing to play through some things this week and it was a bizarre source to say the least that alerted me of this (laughs) and (laughs) 
Uh, the Browns didn't practice. When, oh, go ahead. You're going to throw in a joke. No, I'm go not ahead. throwing any jokes. No. I was going to okay. keep a straight face here, given the nature of the source. Yeah, it sounded like it, Chuckles McGee. Well, I, did, I um, debated it and then thought better of it because discretion is the better part of valor. So the source was a little different. Let's just put it that Unorthodox way. is the term I would unorthodox. use. Unorthodox. There you go. And <laughs> the Browns didn't practice Wednesday. And so the initial estimated non-practice practice report didn't have Flacco on it. And then suddenly a few hours later, Flacco magically appeared on the non-practice practice report with a calf injury. Something to monitor. But the reason we all saw the 20 and a half wiped out in the first half, and it's now a consensus 19 and a half because not just the Texans injuries, but, um, you know, whatever this calf injury here is, that's now making its way a little bit more publicly uh, on Joe Flacco. All sorts of interesting things will factor into the handicap uh, this time of year, and you're going to want to continue to monitor the status of a man who is rejuvenated this Cleveland offense with the aerial assault. You look at what Joe Flacco has done, uh, pretty impressive, coming right off the couch, stepping into the offense, uh, and becoming the first Browns quarterback with 300-plus passing yards and back-to-back wins since Brian Seip accomplished the feat back before our time pain in 1980. Seip went on to win the MVP. 212 passing yards for Flacco in the fourth quarter was the most in any quarter by a Browns player in at least the last 45 seasons. Fifth most passing yards, 939 in a quarterback's first three games with the team since 1970. So good on you, Joe Flacco, making a strong case for comeback player of the year by only playing five to six games and keeping this Browns team very much in the mix for the AFC playoffs. Into the NFC we go in an NFC North showdown between the Detroit Lions and the Minnesota Vikings. The Lions are a field goal favorite on the road, number trending towards three and a half total on this game. Largely unmoved, did open 46 and a half, has moved down to the key of 47. The Lions have an opportunity on Sunday to snap the second longest active drought in the NFL without a division title going all the way back to 1993 with a win versus the Vikings the last time they actually won a division title the Panthers Ravens Texans and Jaguars did not exist as NFL franchises as if we can drag up more painful memories for Lions fans first 10 win season since 2014 for the Honolulu Blues meanwhile the Vikings they are the king of close games 13 of 14 games decided by one score this season they're just six and seven in one score games this year, though, compared to how they rattled off 11 victories in that role a season ago. Their last three losses, including last weekend's defeat at the hands of the Cincinnati Bengals, have come by a combined six points. First meeting between these teams this season. They'll play again in Week 18. And Payne, the Detroit Lions have everything at their fingertips. They set out this year to win that division title. There were a little bit of ebbs and flows. Defensively, they struggled. Jared Goff didn't quite look himself. Lo and behold, all it took was a bet-the-board best bet to light a fire under Detroit on Saturday night. The offense goes out there and hums against the Denver Broncos. They dial up some pressure packages against Russell Wilson and this group looked like a complete unit capable of putting a little bit of fear into the rest of the NFC. But in steps a Vikings team that can do things defensively that Denver can't, is Detroit able and capable of replicating that kind of dynamic offensive effort against Brian Flores? Yeah, I mean, we've talked a lot of Lions football this season. I would say more than any other year in our our history of bet the board and that's going back what 2014 and there may so. be one prominent listener who has relished that opportunity to hear <laughs> about his beloved lions week in week out it, last week specifically which you, you kind of referenced there you know we both felt the market price was finally fair and in combination with that the matchup was elite and that helped a downtrending Lions offense get back on track. I mean, they started a little sloppy there, right? The first three possessions of that game were not great. Then Detroit goes on and scores six touchdowns on its final seven drives. But everything was comfortable, and everything was perfect for Jared Goff, and it's why we we were on the Lions last week. I mean, got his center Frank Ragnow back. He was home in a dome. You know, He had the complimentary ground game. Lions averaged nearly two and a half yards per rush before first contact. You had Montgomery and Gibbs combined for 28 carries and averaged over 6.6 yards a carry. Goff wasn't pressured much the final three quarters. You had the security blanket, right? And Sam Laporta, who was matched up against the worst defense in terms of defending tight ends in the NFL. Broncos, dead last in EPA, surrendered to tight ends. This week on paper, that matchup just isn't as perfect for Goff and the Lions on the road. One of the loudest environments it's going to be playoff like in Minnesota. The whiteout too for the, the holiday should be fun to watch from a visual standpoint. Yeah, and then you think about who golf's going against. 
you get Brian Flores, who's had Goff's number going back to the Rams Super Bowl days. He's very familiar with the strengths and the weaknesses of Jared Goff. You have a Vikings defense right now, ninth in schedule adjusted rush efficiency, top five in yards allowed before first contact and rate of 10 plus yard runs allowed. Minnesota does a very good job negating explosive runs. They're, they're gap sound, third best in the league. And that's really how the Lions run game is feasted is, is explosives primarily from Gibbs. We know Brian Flores is going to dial up some pressure. It's what he does. The Vikings blitz at the highest rate in the league. Goff has graded out QB 28 out of 41 qualifying quarterbacks when blitzed. I think when you look at some of the coverage types, you're hoping that Brian Flores, with that familiarity, dials up more of the cover two um, than cover three. I think we've talked all season how cover two looks have given Goff some trouble. The the Bears implemented a lot of those, you know, in those two matchups and should have won both games this season. Vikings use the highest rate of cover two in the NFL. Jared Goff dead last in passing efficiency against cover two looks. Now, Flores also plays cover three. He needs to use far less of that because because Goff has kind of torched that. So this very much comes down to Brian Flores and his scheme along with the injury report. And that is something that, you know, to keep all things fair, like you have to mention, Daniil Hunter missed practice with an illness. I fully expect him to play but you don't obviously want that spreading. Do you show up suddenly Saturday morning and, you know, Jay Glazer's out there aboard and, you know, six defenders for for the Vikings have, have come down with the flu. Byron Murphy didn't practice with a hamstring injury, although he's kind of been a struggle bust this season. Harrison Phillips missed with a back injury. He's the key run stopper for Minnesota. So, you know, there's certainly ways Brian Flores and the Vikings can make things difficult for Goff. Just need to, to press the right buttons and, and be healthy. When you look at the other side of the ball for this Vikings group, a failed quarterback sneak ends up costing this team a massive win last weekend against the Bengals. Uh, Kevin O'Connell, I mean, was pretty open about it. He said, we've been pretty successful with the sneak play and pretty successful in those short yardage situations this year. I mean, the Vikings had tried quarterback sneaks eight times on third or fourth and one before Saturday afternoon. The conversion rate was 87.5%, actually higher than the league average. They just weren't able to pick it up. But that shouldn't take away from a Vikings offense that a amassed 424 yards, uh, which was their third highest total of the year. I mean, Nick Mullins is going to give you uneven performances. He's going to look like a million bucks. He's going to make throws that leave you scratching your head. I mean, he's got 24 career giveaways, 23 picks and four fumbles in 19 career starts, but he does have a wealth of weapons at his disposal. And for the first time in a long time, you saw what the Vikings are capable of doing with a maturing Jordan Addison in the tail end of his rookie season, Justin Jefferson opposite him, TJ Hawk. Hawkinson, Ty Chandler goes for 100 yards. So this Vikings offense should be able to move the football against the Lions, but you mentioned the injury report and things going on on the defensive side, a key injury we want to monitor before we truly assess the Vikings offense as well. Yeah, I, before we get to that injury, I think your take on Nick Mullins is is pretty bang on. Now, this was the quarterback, if you remember, whether it was a Monday morning or it was a Thursday show. We were kind of calling for Nick Mullins. We're like, you know, when Kirk Cousins went down, we're like, when does Nick Mullins come off the injury list? We were thinking he was the better option than Josh Dobbs. And, you know, as we fast forward here and we're in, we're in week 16, Kevin O'Connell seems to have, have realized that Nick Mullins is a really confident thrower. And I know that's something we've brought up. He doesn't have the strongest arm. Right. So that that confidence and that willingness to try and make every throw can lead to some mistakes, which you outlined there with, I believe we said 24 turnovers and 19 starts. He had two big ones, second quarter interceptions last week that ended very efficient drives before the half against the Bengals. I would have really sealed that game. But what I did think was quite telling here is Kevin O'Connell entrusted Nick Mullins last week. That was very obvious. You can absolutely run the ball in the Bengals' defense, right? They're 29th in rush efficiency. And then all of a sudden, like the big fellow there, DJ Reader, was carted off with a knee injury in that game against against the Bengals. But you think about the Bengals' run defense, DJ Reader going down, and with a 17-3 lead at one point in the game, the Vikings passed at a rate 4% over expectation. So it immediately tells you Kevin O'Connell is more than comfortable with, with Nick Mullins here. And I think that's the key because... You're obviously going to need him in this matchup because Detroit 
does a very, very good job stopping the run. This is going to have to be on Nick Mullins and Justin Jefferson and Jordan Addison and TJ Hawkins and doing most of the offensive damage through the air going up against the Lions defense that's well below average defending the pass. Season long, the Lions are below average in schedule adjusted pass defense. The trending data, though, far worse. Since week eight, the Lions are 30th in passing success rate allowed, 27th in EPA per pass allowed, and that's come against all but one offense ranked inside the top 15 in pass efficiency. You go down this list, and it's, it's the Raiders, it's the Chargers, the Bears twice, Saints, Denver. They all rank 15th or worse in passing efficiency. The one passing offense that's better than that was the Packers, and they absolutely torched the Lions secondary on Thanksgiving, allowed a career game to Jordan Love on a short week at home. The Lions struggle defending tight ends. We've outlined that most weeks we break down their games. Add in the fact now you have TJ Hawkinson who sees a, a massive target share with, you know, some added motivation against his former team. And I think, you, you know, probably have some nice matchups there. Going back to your initial question, though, two injuries on this side that you have to monitor is right tackle Brian O'Neill missed last week, didn't practice Wednesday. It's an ankle injury. Last year, he suffered an Achilles injury. It's on the same leg. <sighs> kind of get the vibe they're going to be cautious with this. And then all of a sudden, flip it around to the Lions. Gardner Johnson, Lions slot corner, was cleared last week but didn't play. This could be his potential return spot, which certainly would help and, and give the Lions secondary a bit of a boost. He said he was fine to play, but it was a confidence thing. So this the injury report's key here. Like I think, you know, when you look at the consensus line right now, you know, Minnesota plus three and a half minus twenty, we'll call it. The line is is certainly a, a bit high. And you you couldn't ask for a better spot. The injury report is is uh not helpful. It's tough right now. Yeah, it's yeah, it's not helpful. So you know, if you have the most extreme situation where you get like Daniil Hunter and Byron Murphy and Harrison um, out and then Gardner Johnson's up and, you know, maybe the, the flu spreads a little bit like that would suck. If you get something in between that, you know, three and a half minus 20 again is, is probably uh a price too high for the Lions to be laying on the road here in this spot. An interesting dynamic for a Vikings team that started the team extremely poorly. If you'd have told them after 14 games they had an opportunity to control their own destiny and get into the playoffs, they would have signed off. And the Lions, credit to them, they came into the year with high expectations, uh, were pegged as a divisional favorite, and are now one win away from doing something that they haven't accomplished as a franchise since 1993. Uh, into the late afternoon time slot, pain and arguably the game of the weekend, or at least on Sunday, that's for sure, but between the Dolphins and the Dallas Cowboys. It's Miami, a one and a half point favorite as they'll welcome in the star total on the game at 50. When we look at the Dolphins and Cowboys, they rank top two in scoring offense. Miami comes in at 31 and a half points per game. The Dallas Cowboys is shade less at 30.8. They have combined for eight of the 18 40 point games that offenses have generated so far this year in the NFL. They've combined for five of the eight highest single game scoring totals this year as well. And it's tied for the latest matchup in NFL history between teams averaging 30 plus points per game 2020 Packers versus Titans also week 16 when we look at the Cowboys and Dolphins the knock on both of these teams have been look they can't beat good football teams the only win coming against opposition that's got a 500 or better record was the Dallas Cowboys knocking off the Philadelphia Eagles on Sunday Night Football it's the first game in NFL history between teams with 20 plus combined wins but just one or fewer victories against teams with a 500 or better record the Cowboys not the same team home and road we saw that on full display dealing with the flu bug last week as they could not stop the run in their loss against the Buffalo Bills. Meanwhile, the Dolphins bounce back with a chip on their shoulder against the Jets. Defense doing things that we hadn't seen from them in quite some time, completely stymieing the Zach Wilson and Trevor Simeon show. When we look at this Cowboys group, I mean, this team has been resilient. Last nine games following a loss, 9-0, and averaging 34 plus points per game, 15.5 points per game allowed, and Dak Prescott, 76% completions, 288 yards passing, and 20 touchdowns to just three interceptions in steps of Dallas offense against a Dolphins defense that could be down a few key cogs, but it's not like Dallas is the model of health either with some offensive line questions that they'll have to address before kickoff on Sunday. 
So all of the talk about both these teams really struggling when they step up in competition is, you know, you kind of throw it out the window because both teams are having those issues. But do you think it's reality? I kind of get the vibe it's more reality potentially for for Dallas. Do you think it's a thing for the Dolphins? Because I go through this this list of, of teams, right? It's like, yeah, you got drubbed at Buffalo, but when Buffalo plays to their peak and is doing things well, like that's a very tough place to play. Both teams were drubbed by Buffalo and Buffalo. Yeah, that data point the, washes itself. Yeah, The Eagles game for me is, that game's very close, and all of a sudden the Dolphins are playing with one starting offensive lineman in that spot as guys go down throughout that game and the Eagles kind of spiked the late down variance. And then the Chiefs game in Germany, I believe it was, or yep. London, Germany. And so, like, you got at least a 10-point swing there on the Tyreek Hill fumble. So I, I, I don't know if it's as much of a thing for the Dolphins. And, you know, kind of want to talk through this game more than just kind of rattle off some stuff because – in my mind, you know, the price is going to matter most. The injuries are going to matter most. And so... I mean, both of these teams are beyond banged up. The Dolphins more yes, so than the Cowboys, but the Cowboys aren't exactly a model of health either. If Zach Martin can't go, and suddenly a right. Dolphins defense that's got a good defensive line can generate pressure. I mean, Bradley Chubb looked like a man possessed last week against the Jets. <laughs> And, and Van Ginkle has been the silent hero for them. I mean, Miami's defense is undoubtedly trending well, as we kind of expected once a very difficult scheme that Vic Fangio implements became less foreign to the players, right? It's been just a complete 180 in terms of, of scheme for those players, and now that they're able to adapt a little bit better, and you looked like since week eight, you're looking at Dolphins defense, number one in EPA per play allowed, number one in success rate allowed, only 32% of opponent plays have graded successful over that stretch against Miami's defense. However... Like, this is just a massive step up in class. You look at that schedule of offense as Miami's played over this this stretch. It's the Jets twice. It's the Titans, Washington, Vegas, the Patriots. I mean, you're talking bottom five offenses. Yes, the Chiefs are a part of that that defensive sample. Um, it's the one top ten offense Miami's played over, you know, that, that stretch. But I still think, you know, they're finding their footing. Kansas City right and some of the injuries are back for the Dolphins so and again the injury report's going to be massive Javon Holland hasn't played since week 12 didn't practice Wednesday let's see what it looks like today Xavier Howard got injured in the Titans game missed last week didn't practice Wednesday Jalen Phillips we know tore his Achilles Jerome Baker knee injury Deshaun Elliott was hurt in the Titans game and so where I'm going with this I don't think we see a Dolphins defense that on paper is number one in EPA per play allowed since week eight in this spot this feels like a much better spot for the Cowboys offense now that multiple key cogs are no longer dealing with the flu the protection was actually very good up front for the Cowboys last week even when Zach Martin went down it's a quad injury it doesn't seem long term will he be out there this week I don't know but even with you know that tough Bills environment last week. Dak pressure was only uh, Dak Prescott was only pressured on twenty four percent of his dropbacks. He was he was kept pretty upright, and so I think there's going to be some plays to be had here, especially if the Dolphins secondary is is down some key cogs. But again, like this to me, far more about price and injury report than some of these matchups. I mean, you look at the other side. Who's available on the Dolphins O line? All five starters missed practice on Wednesday, and like Mike McDaniel did a fantastic job combating you know the Jets defensive line which on paper had a massive edge against the Dolphins O-line last week and it was partly why the Jets got steamed don't they just throw you, don't they just throw money at problems down in South Florida when it comes to no, playing football it. to try and correct their issues <laughs> stop it um <laughs> that's good a day after uh signing day I like that so in the Titans game on Monday night go back there and when you know, Tyreek Hill went down and the offensive line injuries were a mess. Basically, it just became like, hey, we're going to throw this outside zone run game and we're just going to throw quick short passes. That's basically been the MO of, of Mike McDaniel. Now that that's on film, like, does that happen? Like, two of last week, 2.1 second release time. It was awesome. So when I look at this matchup, it becomes feast or famine in that I think the Dolphins, if Tua is not pressured, 
are going to hit some explosive plays against an aggressive man coverage Dallas defense. Dallas is number one in the NFL in in man coverage usage rate. Their corners, inherently, when you look at them, a guy like Bland is uber aggressive. So if you're going to get Waddle and Tyreek healthy, both obviously also on the injury report, you, you can't play that style against those types of receivers. They're going to get you eventually. So it's kind of that variance in that, hey, if Tua can get the ball off in time and Dallas is going to be playing man coverage and their corners are going to be uber aggressive, you're going to have some some big explosives. At the same time, if all five guys are down on the offensive line, that Dallas defensive front is certainly going to put some pressure on Tua, and we know what his splits look like. He has not been very good in terms of adjusted accuracy when he's pressured. I would assume you throw in the film, Mike McDaniel is going to look and be like, oh my God, right? Buffalo just bullied Dallas defensively last week, and Dallas is you know, bottom 10 run defense. The difference is, you're down five offensive linemen. The style of which your ground game is is far different than what Buffalo implemented last week. Last week, Buffalo is just you know running right at you, running right up your ass. It's more of an outside zone scheme, uh, a little more daintier uh, for, for Mike McDaniel. And then you look at the injury report there. Mosert is having a fantastic season, one of the most efficient backs in the league, You know, battling through some things. Devin A-Chain battling through some things with with the toe injury so <laughs> when I come to this again it's very much to me about price because if, if the Dolphins are 100% healthy here Todd oh they become the side oof, 100% oof, I think you're making a case uh, to Dallas, go under ooh, here 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 you yeah, here you go as we talk about this is funny uh Dallas is getting hit right now because what I was going to say is if if Miami is 100% healthy here they are basically a pick them on a neutral against Buffalo and so last week on game day, we were able to lay minus 125 on the Buffalo money line prior to this move here on, on the Cowboys, right? You could lay minus, you know, 125 on on the Dolphins. But again, what I'm saying is like not just super injured. So you can't really get to that price where they would, would match Buffalo. And so, you know, I understand people probably are looking at the Cowboys game last week and saying, hey, you know, their power number didn't really adjust much. I just think that the Dolphins injuries here um, monitoring those how those trend are are, are vital here uh, and it's the least surprising thing in the world that Dallas is taking money here as the limits ticked up a touch here on Thursday well how you wonder I don't even know what time the Dolphins start practicing in terms of who is out there or available at 11 15 eastern time uh, on a Thursday morning either so interesting game uh, clearly both these teams a lot to prove both to themselves and the rest of the league to try and get back on track the Dolphins strength to schedule from here on out pain they're gonna have to earn everything that they're doing uh, they'll take on the Dallas Cowboys this week they'll get the Baltimore Ravens next week and the Buffalo Bills in that week 18 finale that could either be for the division or a chance for the Dolphins to send the Bills home for the holidays and keep them out of the AFC playoff picture. You can follow Payne on social media at Payne Insider. I'm Todd Furman. You can follow me there. Most importantly, for all things Bet the Board, you can follow the podcast at Bet the Board Pod. Uh, and Payne, normally we would have a Monday show, so we'd have a lot more information at our disposal to preview arguably the biggest game of the entire weekend in the Baltimore Ravens and the 49ers. But because of the Christmas holiday, we'll break down that Monday nighter now. It's the reason that we're bypassing the lovely pillow fight that we could see on Sunday night between the New England Patriots and the Denver Broncos. The 49ers, a five-point home favorite, total on the game 47 as Baltimore will travel across the country on a short week, so to speak, having played on Sunday night football, marking the second week 16 or later game since 1970 between teams tied for the best record in the NFL. Happened in 1993 when Dallas took on the New York Giants. Brock Purdy, continues to be favored in every single regular season game that he has started as a member of the 49ers. These two teams rank top two in scoring defense. Baltimore at 16.1 points per game. The 49ers at 16.7. We can share all the superlatives we want about Brock. We'll get to those in a minute. When we look at underdogs, they have now won outright the past seven games on Monday Night Football. It's the longest streak of underdogs winning outright on Monday Night Football since... The well, history of the program, according to ESPN Stats and Info, and Lamar has flourished catching points in his career. Nine and four straight up as a dog. Uh, 
and the second largest dog price of Jackson's career will be on Monday night. The biggest one was when he made his starting debut against the Kansas City Chiefs, catching a full touchdown, and the Ravens 15-2 and against the spread the last 17 games, catching points. Payne, there are so many different ways to go trying to unpack this fun handicap when we look at the 49ers offense matched up against the Ravens defense or the Ravens offense without Keaton Mitchell going up against the 49ers defense. It's been able to generate a heck of a lot more pressure with Nick Bo Bosa and Chase Young on opposite ends, but the Niners are dealing with some defensive injuries along the defensive line. Two key cogs that were kept out last week and allowed the Arizona Cardinals to run for a half a mile, albeit in a loss as a double-digit dog. (laughs) Let's start with the Ravens offense, and as I I look at this game and dive into some of the matchups, the first thing that, that came to mind was that the Ravens really need to muddy this game up. Like, go go old school, right? Methodical drives, fire up the Gus bus. I don't think the Ravens can get in a shootout here where, you know, you think, like, where, where are the explosive plays coming from without Keaton Mitchell, who you mentioned? And then suddenly Zay Flowers has a foot injury, whereas, you know, seen in a boot, missed practice Wednesday. If Zay does play, I don't think he's 100%. So, you know, where's that explosiveness coming from for the Ravens offense? You also have, obviously, the security blanket of Mark Andrews being out and that was kind of the guy Lamar would look to when when he was pressured to kind of get him out of a, a little bit of a bind and and there's a reason Lamar Jackson is running more and running with purpose the last couple of weeks 23 rush attempts for 167 yards the last two games and and the Raven, and the reason is the Ravens offense needs that punch Lamar's legs have been a big factor when going up against unfamiliar NFC teams you see Lamar multiple times a season, and over the course of a few seasons, you know what his legs can do if you're an AFC opponent. Get Lamar for the first time, or the first time in a long time, and it kind of becomes an acclimation process. But I think the run game is needed here because the Ravens' passing game is a little bit just clunky right now. I, I they kind of went through this little, you know, surge where you're like, okay. This, this thing's going to come on. The Monk and Lamar offense is just going to be humming now that they figured it out after, you know, eight, nine, ten weeks. But you just look, even against a poor Jaguar secondary, down multiple starters in Tyson Campbell and Cisco, it wasn't some, like, passing expose there put on by, by, by Lamar Jackson in that offense. In the wind really subsided so it wasn't a factor I mean, we're talking three straight games now where Lamar's completed less than 59 percent of his pass and it's come against three poor pass defenses so again I, just, I think the Ravens need to impose their will at the line of scrimmage if they can have to play a physical ground and pound game the one area that you kind of hinted at where the 49ers could have some trouble and they've been a little susceptible this season is is on the ground in totality below average and defensive rush efficiency allowed for the 49ers and then you think about the two big fellas inside, they're they're both dinged. Eric Armstead hasn't played since week 13. You got the big money man there, Javon Hargrave, missed last week. Javon Kinlaw is not a run defender. Um, if, if 60 is your um, average grade against the run, you're looking at Javon, uh, you're looking at uh, Kinlaw basically at 29 like he's just he's terrible against the run you have Khalil Davis was thrown into the mix week 13 when Armstead went down he's a rotational interior piece he left the Cardinals game with an injury uh, even Colin Farrell got dinged up last week we know Hafunga is out for the season with the knee injury he was by far the best third level run defender the 49ers had so I mean you just look all told the Cardinals last week averaged more than 3.1 yards per rush before first contact against his 49ers defense you also have to keep an eye on the 49er slot corner Lenore uh, left with a rib injury last week we know the important role he's played moving inside to slot and getting Isaiah Oliver off the field but I just think the initial path is the Ravens turning back the clock a bit here going you know Greg Roman style bully ball you know run game and attacking the weakness on paper and potentially you know with guys missing on the inside of, of that 49ers D line I just I think the line will move here, Todd, based upon the availability of, of Armstead and Hardgrave. If both those guys get announced up, you, you're probably moving to six. If both get downgraded, you're probably looking at, at soft four, maybe even three and a half. It's a fascinating matchup when you look at 
uh, wanting some of that beef on the interior to make the Ravens one dimensional, force that Lamar to go into hostile territory, win it entirely with his arm if they're a little bit more bottled up on the ground. But the Ravens can do it on the other side of the ball as well. I mean, this is a team second in the NFL in total defense, seventh in passing defense. Last game marked a fifth time this season where they allowed fewer than 10 points, most in the NFL. Number one in points allowed, number two in yards allowed, fifth and third down defense. When we look at their passing defense specifically, 5.6 yards per attempt allowed this season. It's the best since the 2011 Steelers. They are outstanding when it comes to eliminating yards after the catch. Such an important facet of everything that the 49ers do since they lead in that particular department. They're holding opposing quarterbacks to their third lowest rating. You look at Marlon Humphrey. Didn't look like himself at all in the Rams game. Looked significantly healthier uh, against the Jaguars. Granted, the Jaguars didn't really offer much in the way of a vertical passing threat given some of their limitations there. We're seeing Kyle Hamilton fight through that MCL injury and had nothing but received nothing but praise from some of his teammates uh, for fighting through it. You look at Justin Matabuke finally getting the interior pressure that this Ravens defense had lacked. He's now amassed at least a half a sack in 11 straight games, tied for the longest streak in a season since 1982. But here comes the 49ers offense, led by MVP frontrunner Brock Purdy, uh, doing all sorts of things from a quarterback rating and a yards per attempt side that we haven't seen in quite a while. When we look at what this offense does, Big, the big four of Christian McCaffrey, Debo Samuel, Brandon Ayuk, and George Kittle have combined for 2,300 scrimmage yards and 23 touchdowns during the six-game win streak. I mean, Debo Samuel reminding us why he's the cheat code as a runner and as a receiver. When we look at this 49ers offense against the Ravens defense, I mean, I know what the numbers say, Payne, but I watch this Ravens stop unit, and I can't help but be underwhelmed for stretches do the 49ers have the pieces that you need to be able to go out there and force the Ravens to play outside their comfort zone? This to me is one of the more fun matchups of the entire season. Like just this side of the ball specifically. I know everyone's, you know, Monday night, you know, potentially a Super Bowl matchup for me. It's like, yeah, you know, I mean, it's, it's not a, it's not a conference game. I think it has less impact than people actually think. But in terms of like just this matchup, it's awesome because you can make cases for for both both sides, right? Both units on this matchup. Like Brock Purdy to me is is proving his worth, and I think at this stage he's he's the clear cut MVP. But I also think two things can be true, and a lot of people have a, a tough time understanding that. Like Purdy can be a system quarterback while also raising the ceiling of that system and quite literally popping the lid off of it. Right. And so I think that's maybe where some of the head scratching comes with this price where you see the 49ers minus five and a half, because we all realize, you know, Brock Purdy is not more valuable to their team than a Mahomes or Josh Allen. We saw a guy like Jimmy G who can't get on the field right now, operate this 49ers offense to a point where he's fifth, among all quarterbacks with at least 500 dropbacks from 2012 to 2022 and EPA plus completion percentage over expectation. But when I look at Brock Purdy and I talk about raising the ceiling, Brock Purdy is number one in that same metric since 2012. If you go all the way through last week's games, that's better than Mahomes metrically in dropback EPA and passing success rate. So he's, he's really taking the offense to another level, even though there is some system involved in that. And I, I think this, you look at the, the schedule, this is easily going to be the 49ers toughest test in a while. I mean, they have played nothing but like dog shit passing defenses since week seven. You look at the last seven games, the 49ers have not faced a top 10 passing defense last four weeks. The average efficiency rank of pass defenses that Brock Purdy and the 49ers have played 27th. Mike McDonald also does a really good job of protecting his secondary the Ravens use light boxes at one of the lightest rates in the entire league right they just they if you look pretty much down down it's like one of the highest rates of of light boxes and so I think that's the kind of the cat and mouse of this matchup you want to take Purdy and Ayuk and Debo and Kittle away and all of a sudden like you're using light boxes against the 49er Shanahan offense that you know, probably not smart to do. And if you look on the season, Baltimore 22nd in both EPA per rush allowed and rushing success rate allowed on early downs and non-garbage time. 
and the Ravens' run defense is also trending poorly. Since week 10, 27th in EPA per rush allowed, dead last in success rate allowed on early downs. So I don't know how you can use light boxes against this 49ers offense because the 49ers love to use heavy personnel, especially on early downs. You, you, You can't be in these light boxes. And against an uber efficient run team like the 49ers, who are third most efficient in running the football this season. And so, you know, I don't really know how that's going to look. And then you start to look at the run offenses the Ravens have faced recently. The Chargers 30th in rush efficiency, Jacksonville 24th, the Browns 22nd, the Bengals and Seahawks both below league average. The Cardinals, yes, top 10, but when they played the game, James Conner wasn't available. And when you look and actually parse out just running back runs, the Cardinals aren't top 10. So the only rushing attack in recent times that's top 10 Baltimore's faced was the team we talked about at the top of this podcast, right? Kyron Williams in the Rams. And and Kyron kind of grinded his way to 114 yards. It was an efficient 114. And he provided some balance. And the Rams offense was humming a dome team, mind you, right? In, in In some weather and a sloppy surface. So sure, like Brock Purdy's stepping up in class. The Ravens' defense is stepping up in class. I just get the feeling here the 49ers can do both, run or pass, and it'll be predicated on the looks that Mike uh, Mike McDonald shows them. I don't think the Ravens' defense can stop the pass and run simultaneously. So if McDonald McDonald has these, you know, keeps the the high usage rate of light boxes, the 49ers are going to run. If he allocates more to the box, Purdy in the throw game probably finds success here because I know you and I have talked a little bit about Humphrey kind of downtrending a touch there. So I, on this side of the ball, it just feels like the 49ers can do both and the Ravens might have to, to kind of pick their poison. It's such an interesting matchup because this is a Ravens team that you look at, you know, one of the last big offensive tests they faced in inclement weather. We previewed at the top of the show. I mean, the Rams were able to move the football when they wanted to. Some of that had a lot to do with Marlon Humphrey not looking like himself. But even if he trends up, I just don't see him as the same elite corner that he was a couple of seasons ago. We'll see if the 49ers like to target him we're going a different direction. Kyle Hamilton has clearly um, been a hell of a lot better than I expected, was a little bit surprised with where the Ravens drafted him, but credit on their defensive development, they've deployed him to the best of his abilities, Roquan Smith and everybody else. I just always find it interesting pain for a Ravens team that has thrived in the underdog role. I mean, that all the players were asked about it this week, and they said it showed a sign of disrespect, this, that, and the other. Uh, I love some of the pettiness that goes into games like this. Clearly, these teams would love to go out there and prove to one another that they are going to be formidable down the stretch but uh, to your point uh, I don't think either will define their season based on one 60 minute sample size of how they perform (laughs) knowing that the 49ers have an inside track to being the number one seed in the NFC much like the Ravens do in the AFC uh, as the way things stand right here going into week 16. I mean completely agree and typically the Ravens are extremely self-motivated and now all of a sudden you give them some some headline material here where they're an underdog of this size and, and they're going to play it up and use it to their advantage. And they have been absolutely outstanding, like a cash machine when an underdog. And we know what Lamar Jackson's done when he faces the NFC. So all of those cursory, like grazing ATS stuff, it's I don't usually pay much attention to it, but there's at least some some merit to it when you know kind of how the Ravens franchise is built. So I thought I would come into this game and, you know, want to lay the 49ers because I I haven't loved what I've seen from the Ravens. The price obviously has gotten away a little bit here. Um, would have would have loved and died to lay, you know, three minus 20. But uh, now that we're at like five and a half, it's just... <laughs> It's difficult, but uh, I, d- I do think the 49ers offense probably has the larger advantage of, of, of the two sides here. But uh, nonetheless, a, a great Christmas night game here for us. Should be one hell of a football game. Some marquee matchup this weekend, and they will all kick off on Thursday Night Football with the Rams and Saints. A fascinating matchup in its own right uh, when we look at some of the playoff and big picture implications. You can follow Payne on social media at Payne Insider. I'm Todd Furman. You can follow me there. Most importantly, follow the podcast at Bet the Board Pod. And Payne, 
Don't call it a winning streak just yet, but uh, the NFL train has officially been on the tracks the last handful of weeks. Things really starting to click as everything coming together late in the year. And they say it's all about when you're playing your best football that allows you to win a Lombardi trophy. When it comes to the best bet portion of the program, uh, what are we thinking this week? I never look at it that way. I don't ever really... I just, you know, I look at this stretch and I just kind of think about whether it's me personally or the podcast, like, you know, seasons are kind of the stop point, right? And the stop and start, but it's like, you know, since 2014, this is kind of what we've been doing. Oh, it's big. Uh, It's big picture. The track record is there and it speaks for itself. So, I mean, I think the win streak's nice. What is it up to? Four in a row. Let's hopefully make it five. And I think this is the the fun dynamic with the NFL market is that one week you are buying an asset the next week you are selling that same asset and so are you calling me an asset game week- <laughs> hey the shoe if fits the hat, if the if the, if the hat fits in this case <laughs> um so we talked about this a little bit earlier it'll be time stamped for a full breakdown above Let's go with the Minnesota Vikings at home plus three and a half minus a dollar twenty. So the first thing, let's talk about price. There is some if you shop around, some three and a half minus fifteen out there. The places that are mostly using three and a half have minus one twenty. The places that are dealing three, it's juiced on the lions and you can get to plus three and a half minus twenty there. So let's let let's call that the price. I think there's some asymmetric risk here with the injuries that we talked about in that, you know, if they all go wrong, you're probably at three and a half flat and you've, you've lost some, lost a touch of value, but you're still in the game based upon the matchups in my estimation. If you get half or all of those guys back, I mean, this price is way off. I mean, just looking at these two teams at its core, this is the price we would make a game on this matchup on the neutral field. And so, I mean, this is Minnesota's still in this thing, right? They're the sixth seed. They're in the playoffs. It starts today. You got two matchups against the Lions down the stretch. I understand the idea that potentially they're being gutted. But when I look at the price of this game and think about what we've seen in recent times, like the Vikings blew that game last week against Cincinnati. What's this price if they win it on the scoreboard? Because they sure One and a half, won two. it in the box score, right? What's this price if. Detroit doesn't find its groove last week and kind of what I'm wondering is did they find their their groove or was it just a great fucking matchup against Denver it was a great matchup and it was a situational spot that we said Denver could be flat as a board and they look like they had no life in that game so the price here to me is is just off and and that's really what this is predicated on and then all of a sudden you know there's some matchups within this game that are nice with you know Minnesota's receivers against a very lackluster pass defense some things that Brian Flores has done in the past against Jared Goff kind of how his defense is designed in general uh giving Goff some problems with the things that Goff has been very poor at this season so you're getting all of the elements it's just you know you wish the injury news was was a little bit more pristine but uh nevertheless best bet 468 Minnesota Vikings plus three and a half minus a dollar twenty as the official grade. Show up and show out, Purple People Eater fans. You guys are fighting for a playoff berth on the holiday weekend. We know it'll be their winter carnival, whatever the heck they're calling it, an ice out, all white. Uh, let's see what Nick Mullins can do against this Lions defense, and we will hope that the injury report complies with our best wishes to bring this number down to a flat three before it closes at kickoff and maybe even trend lower than that. All right, my friend, uh, we've done enough damage. Five games. Oh, it's, if those guys are all in, like is it going two and a half? All right, well we'll take we'll um, take that too if we can get it. <laughs> get our right. get our money in good and hope for the Merry, best. Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah. Enjoy some cocktails and your family and be safe. We out of here. Is that it? Yep. I think that's uh, pretty much it. We'll be back next Wednesday to talk all things college bowl games in addition to what Brad Powers always covered. Encourage. What's up? 
playoffs, uh, college football playoffs, yeah, baby. Awesome. I'm actually looking forward to that. It's got a little uh, high leverage situations. No opt outs, at least to our knowledge on those games. We'll see if that changes between now and then. <laughs> but for anybody that's out there who wants to get an edge on the college football bowl games, I mean, Brad Powers did an outstanding job, covered 29 games, did it in a compact format, an hour of your time, opt outs, transfer portal, where the market opened, where the market moved. There's nobody better for that. Uh, we know all of you folks are looking to try and wager with a little bit of an edge with those bowl games. Encourage you folks to take a listen to that, even if you are primarily an NFL better. Uh, and no NFL podcast on Monday on the Christmas holiday. As Payne said, we'll be back next Thursday to talk week 17. And in the meantime, best of luck with all of your investments. Enjoy quality times with friends, families, and loved ones this weekend. But most importantly, with the Minnesota Vikings taken in hand come Sunday afternoon, we'll see you at the window. We hope you enjoyed listening to this episode of Bet the Board. Make sure you follow Todd and Payne on X. Todd is at Todd Furman. That's T-O-D-D-F-U-H-R-M-A-N. And Payne is at Payne Insider. That's P-A-Y-N-E-I-N-S-I-D-E-R. Don't forget, our weekly newsletter comes with an additional best bet. Have that delivered to your inbox by clicking the link atop the podcast show notes. And most importantly, subscribe and download Bet the Board. We're on Apple, Spotify, Amazon Wondery, YouTube, Google Podcasts, and all your other major platforms. 